Uh, now from R Street Institute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. In response to the threats brought up by the delegate from Mozambique and others regarding breaches of personal privacy and an overall lack of accountability and recourse, we would like to discuss the larger problem that this issue points to, which is a lack of data sharing as a factor contributing to an overall threatening cyber environment. More specifically, we'd like to discuss cross-border data sharing and by extension, restrictive data localization practices. With an increasingly interconnected ICT global community comes a massive amount of valuable data about human activity. As a result, there's a desire by companies to move data freely across borders to facilitate economic and social activity and a similar desire by governments to protect it for their purposes. This brings us to a sort of finer point of the global data regulation debate and one on which we believe it's possible to achieve a majority consensus, data localization and cross-border data data transfers. Regardless of the desires of various equities involved in this discussion about fluidity of and access to data, one principle remains true. Internet commerce and communication thrive on the free flow of information and open sharing of data. Digital borders will only serve to harm the global economy, breed mistrust among various equities, and further insecurity in an already insecure cyber environment. Increasingly, states have begun implementing data localization laws that require all data generated within the country to be physically stored there. These blanket data localization practices, in our view, are simply a second iteration of internet border controls, the first being censorship. The international community has condemned unjustified restrictions on the flow of information into a country in the form of censorship, and it must now condemn unjustified restriction on the flow of information out of the country in the form of unjustified data localization. While we recognize that restricting some forms of sensitive data may be necessary to ensure personal privacy or national security, we similarly argue that unjustified restriction of data transfers must be disallowed in a future global ICT agreement. We understand the desire for member states to keep the value of its data within its borders to avoid intellectual property theft or other harmful action, restrict foreign suppliers from infiltrating a delicate domestic market, or readily access useful information. However, we believe these reasons do not comport with the purpose of the UN to overall maintain peace and security, or with what we see as the chief function of the internet to facilitate free and open global communications. We believe the OEWG must recognize that there are illegitimate purposes for restricting the free flow of data. Economic protectionism, in our view, is one such illegitimate reason. We fear that many states may express legitimate reasons for localizing data as a shield for truly illegitimate purposes. And we therefore implore that as member states consider, uh, consider their options throughout these few days, uh, that they define what they consider to be legitimate and strongly condemn actions outside of that issued guidance. As for legitimate purposes, we would encourage member states to consider that data is not safe solely because it's stored within their borders. If a government is concerned uh, with what we would call a justified event, like a law enforcement's need to access data or access to data relevant to a cyber incident, or as the delegate from Mozambique mentioned, a general mishandling of personal private data, then we would encourage member states to consider, when appropriate, retaining supervisory access over that data and to require a copy to potentially be stored domestically, but not to restrict cross-border data transfers altogether. And while these policies remain our recommendations for best practices, we recognize and affirm each member state's right to sovereignty, of course, and concede that not every member state will agree to such limited data localization practices, Therefore, in light of that reality, we would recommend that for states who are unwilling or unable to abide, abide by this norm, to utilize bilateral, multilateral treaties. Of course, even treaties may not be enough to ensure that each country is willing to lift data localization practices, uh, or excuse me, restrictions to the degree necessary to facilitate free and open data sharing practices. In that instance, um, in which an agreement cannot be met, such as with companies refusing to allow host states to retain data from another country's data subjects, that um, we would utilize encryption and similar cipher technology uh, to secure the data but still respect and abide by the country's localization laws. Uh, as we discuss facilitating data transfers, it's important to acknowledge that not all recipients will be equipped with the cybersecurity and privacy standards necessary. Uh, in these cases, our organization has looked to the European Union's GDPR, Articles 45 through 49, 
uh, for guidance, and we highly recommend that member states do the same and consider adopting a global version of this. Overall, data is valuable, and we, we recognize that, and protecting it is necessary. Uh, however, there are remedies that exist that do not unduly restrict the free and peaceful flow of data across borders. And we would argue that erecting digital borders will only weaken the global economy and strongly urge each member state to consider this proposal as an alternative to data localization and restrictive data access laws. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Now I call the delegate from R Street uh, Institute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My intervention concerns the application of international law to the use of ICTs. As part of this important discussion, a debate currently exists on whether a new comprehensive cyber convention is necessary to address ongoing cybersecurity challenges. A future comprehensive convention may be useful at some point in the future. It could, after all, serve as an important source of international law and provide greater legal clarity for member states. Nevertheless, this working group should prioritize how stakeholders can support governments to implement important cyber norms that were previously agreed to in 2015. The unique and involving challenges in the ICT environment support this better approach. To note, a new cyber convention would not be the first of its kind. The Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, for instance, has been signed and ratified by dozens of states. The only modern agreement of its kind, the convention has been a success. But as technology evolves, the agreement needs modernization. A similar fate would likely befall any other comprehensive cyber convention, despite its potential positive merits. Another concern. Through nego negotiation and consistent developments in ICTs, a new cyber convention has the potential to be both over-inclusive and under-inclusive. It could both instill legally binding restrictions that could unintentionally limit ICT advancement, while at the same time, failing to address every category of previously agreed to norms, resulting in the unfortunate and mandatory prioritization of some norms over others. Even if the process began for a new cyber convention, it should not distract from this working group's work on how to implement previously agreed to norms. After all, the strength of many conventions is its ability to serve as a guide for member states to craft its own legislation and policies that are globally more uniform and helpful. The implementation of norms asserted in the 2015 GGE report can already serve this important purpose. Beyond a new cyber convention, another dispute exists on whether certain aspects of international law, including international humanitarian law, apply in cyberspace. We believe, like many in this room today, that IHL does apply, and we are not persuaded that it would invite greater conflict or eager military retaliation for cyber mischief. Many of these fears, for instance, fail to consider important international humanitarian law principles of necessity, humanity, distinction, and proportionality. Above all, these legal debates, while important, can and should remain separate from the working group's work to prioritize the pragmatic implementation of existing, already agreed to norms. Thank you. I now call on the delegate from the R Street Institute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The principles and norms put forth by the previous GGE and international agreements like Tech Accord and Paris Call are an important start to this crucial conversation. But as many have mentioned, norms are not enough. States must also implement domestic policies that proactively enforce and implement these norms. I would like to discuss recommendations for implementing one of the norms mentioned in the 2015 GGE report, that of protecting the integrity of the ICT supply chain. The norm reads, States should take res reasonable steps to ensure the integrity of the supply chain so that end users can have confidence in the security of ICT products. States should seek to prevent the proliferation of malicious ICT tools and techniques and use, and use of harmful hidden functions. While the inclusion of this norm is an excellent step, the 2015 GGE report did not offer further explanation on what types of actions count as reasonable steps. This group has the opportunity to recommend what those reasonable steps will be. Supply chain integrity isn't just about employing specific technical solutions, although technical solutions can and should play an important role in any state's ICT strategy. Supply chain integrity is about global trust. 
States should agree to not force ICT companies to include back doors in ICT devices, as well as avoiding other systematic government interventions in the ICT supply chain. Building back doors into ICT devices or mandating access to ICT data through some sort of golden key is an idea that can seem both appealing and alarming when it comes to a state's national security. The idea can be appealing because of the wealth of information it could potentially provide a government regarding the activities and communications of criminals and even potential terrorists. However, the idea is equally alarming because of the idea that non-domestic companies may be forced to provide data on a state's citizens to a foreign government, as well as the potential for abuse by rogue states who use data to persecute political protesters or political opponents. States should also pass domestic laws and international treaties that make it easier for companies to reveal discovered vulnerabilities and share information about potential risks. Assessing which links in the supply chain are present can be very difficult. Industry stakeholders do, may not have access to information for a variety of reasons. For example, important information could be considered classified by government agencies and therefore hidden from the private sector. To make it easier to identify potential supply chain risks, States should consider how they can break down these information barriers and look for opportunities to build private-public partnerships, such as creating public commissions to assess the security of the existing ICT supply chain. States should promote responsible risk management practices among industry stakeholders in their own country. Government cannot bear all the responsibility for supply chain integrity. Members of the ICT industry being on the front lines must be proactive in installing rigorous cybersecurity controls. States should seek ways to encourage this responsibility. And finally, states should agree to promote market competition of ICT com companies and not place undue market barriers. States worried about the security of their own ICT systems may be currently considering favoring one domestic supplier as a strategy to protect their national security. However, market competition can actually promote cybersecurity as companies seek to differentiate their products as more secure than their competition. Government-granted monopolies or oligopolies, on the other hand, can provide less pressure to test the cybersecurity of products. Diversification in the marketplace can protect against a systematic collapse or crisis. The global implications of a systematic undermining of the integrity of the ICT supply chain by the government of any nation would extend far beyond economic loss. Violating supply chain integrity would directly diminish international trust, making our world far less secure. Our street urges states and stakeholders to approach si supply chain security with a long-term perspective that maintains international peace and security. Thank you for your intervention. Now I call on the delegate from Our Street Institute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for allowing the Our Street Institute to speak again this morning. Rest assured, this time will not concern global supply chain. Um, instead, this intervention addresses a topic that was briefly brought up near the end of the day yesterday, um, an international cyber court and judicial capacity generally. Um, we would caution against a heavy reliance on an international cyber court. Of course, there are potential merits, um, including transparency and ability for consensus building around what cyber activity or even data storage practices are considered criminal or simply negligent. Such consensus would be welcome. But too often, current and past international courts have been regrettably unsuccessful in equitably hearing cases, whether due to a lack of jurisdiction or an unwillingness on the part of states to cooperate. We, of course, recognize the issue that a lack of judicial capacity and technical expertise in certain states, which hinder the ability to investigate and properly try cybercrimes, supports why capacity building efforts remain essential. But an international court is not the most effective path. We recommend another. This intervention perhaps speaks to a more longer term route and time permitting this afternoon, my colleague will speak to a more immediate policy considerations. But with this in mind, failing to prioritize the implementation of the 2015 GGE norms and instead marching towards a formal adjudicative process may inadvertently disrupt ongoing synergies between governments and stakeholders. Importantly, we see good examples of this implementation already which accomplishes many of the ambitions that a wide-ranging international cyber court would provide. The working papers from Australia, Canada, and the, work in the United Kingdom, for example, are good models. In those papers, they discuss their efforts to investigate, prosecute, and disrupt cybercrime, including how these states work with others to prosecute cybercrime, 
in how they share information to combat cybercrime threats with international partners, which in turn leads to more successful prosecutions in their respective states. As the delegate from Microsoft began this morning, time is not on our side. The delegate is absolutely right. And as a result, the implementation of norms by each member state must remain the, this working group's first priority. Thank you. Thank you. I invite the delegate from R Street Institute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to begin by commending the delegate from Brazil uh, and agreeing with his commentary earlier this afternoon on convergence among member states' approaches in order to avoid a splintered response to common cyber challenges. We all participate in the same cyberspace, stakeholders and states alike. A lack of convergence will only lead to chaos and an insecure cyber environment. Our recommendations stem from this belief. On the topic of confidence building measures, two of the largest concerns are data breaches and poor cybersecurity standards, whether on the part of state or non-state actors. Uh, I will be focusing my intervention on these concerns. As my colleague mentioned earlier today, I will speak to more intermediate policy recommendations around the idea of malicious cyber activity and negligent data practices uh, on either the part of non-state uh, actors or state-sponsored level. There are two different routes which we invite member states to debate the merits of. Both are modeled on existing organizational structures but have slightly different goals. I'll say these slowly for the interpreters. Uh, the first is the structure of the International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, and the second is the structure of the United States' National Transportation Safety Board, or NTSB. I'll now use the acronyms. <laughs> the IAEA was established as an autonomous organization. It's independent of the UN. And though it was established independently of the UN, it, uh, and through its own international treaty, its statute, the IAEA reports to the General Assembly and Security Council. Its programs encourage the development of the peaceful applications of the technology, provide international safeguards against misuse of the technology, and promote safety standards. A cyber IAEA style organization would not be a court of law or law enforcement body, but an independent organization staffed by technologists and by tech legal experts focused on risk reduction with the authority to do three things. The first, encourage development of peaceful cyber technology and coordinate capacity building for efforts among states and regional bodies. Uh, one such regional body would be the EU's Agency for Cybersecurity, which currently engages in great capacity building work in this space already. The second would be providing international safeguards against misuse of the technology based out of the norms and guidance either in the various GGE reports or the paper that this working group will eventually publish. They, this body could also update these guidelines as technology shifts constantly. And then the third would be promoting safety standards and their implementation through independent reports and when necessary, conducting investigations to ensure compliance with universally agreed to norms and guidelines to ensure state accountability. The IAEA itself is an opt-in group. A similar, or excuse me, a similar cyber model would be as well. We would believe such an independent cyber IAEA style group could be helpful, not only in capacity and confidence building, but also in avoiding cyber incidents and negligent or in some cases criminal data practices. The second route was born out of an idea that one of our colleagues back in DC has done some extensive work on, that of a cyber version of the United States National Transportation Safety Board or a cyber NTSB. In the US, the NTSB investigates and reports on certain incidents and accidents in the transportation sector. We would recommend a global cyber organization be structured similarly. When requested, the NTSB also assists military and foreign governments with their accident investigations. The agency also operates a national training center. Imagine this organization at a global scale on the topic of cyber incidents and data breaches. If there is a significant breach, this organization can be called upon to conduct an independent third-party investigation, report, uh, publish a report that can assist with transparency and confidence building regarding these cyber incidents and just general data practices. One additional goal that we can think, you could think about tasking these confidence capacity building organizations with is setting up uh, commute, excuse me, computer emergency response teams, CERTs, or computer security incident response teams, CERTs, which we've heard many people discuss today. 
uh, these, this would obviously be to build the capacity of individual member states to eventually handle these investigations independently and domestically. To further, uh, to further note, we agree wholeheartedly with the delegate from the University of Waterloo on the topic of encryption backdoors or what some call golden keys. Uh, we are against these policies and we believe that building backdoors in encryption technology would undermine confidence in privacy standards across the board. States cannot protect their people if number one, they don't have the capacity to, and number two, there is no recourse for bad actors. We may live in a zero trust cyber environment, but there are ways to build confidence. And we believe these global independent organizations to coordinate capacity building and confidence building measures are an important step. We would be interested to hear a debate on the idea of a cyber IAEA style or cyber NTSB style organization as to whether stakeholders or states believe any of these approaches are viable on a global scale. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, invite uh, comments, interventions from the floor. R Street Institute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to uh, intervene in response to the inquiry from ICT for Peace on the idea we brought up about a cyber IAEA. Uh, thank you for your questions. I'm happy to address each in turn. Uh, to begin, to be very clear, no, we do not imagine this IAEA style organization to have any kind of policing abilities or to be a legal organization itself. This idea arose in response to some calls yesterday for an international cyber incident court, which we think presents several concerns. This is one alternative. We brought up the IAEA as precedent for an international and independent group of experts with authority to issue guidance, using these elements as inspiration for what a cyber group could look like and also due to its opt-in structure. The IAEA frequently, uh, or this is in response to the portion where you asked about industry and stakeholders being involved, the IAEA frequently engages consultants and experts under individual contracts, uh, whether they be temporary staff assignments or consultancies. Uh, they typically work on short-term projects. The functions of consultants and experts are typically results-oriented and usually assist in the delivery of specific programmatic activities. This is the same way we would envision um, a stakeholder relationship in a cyber IAEA organization. We imagine that this organization, again, would be opt-in and be guided by a set of norms and guidelines that the GG, uh, GGE has already produced and that this body will produce. We imagine this organization to step in to assist with capacity building as the IAEA does with producing peaceful nuclear cap energy capabilities. We also imagine that in an instance where, for example, two states who are party to the organization's guiding document has, have a dispute over a cyber incident, they could step in to conduct an investi uh, independent investigation report on the facts. Essentially, the, the goal would be for confidence and capacity building uh, sort of in different ways. Happy to address any additional concerns. Please, uh, we're, we're here afterwards. Come speak to us. Thank you. Thank you. I call on the distinguished delegate from R Street Institute. Thank you, Chairman. I extend my gratitude to the scene setting delegates for framing this issue well. I would like to discuss an issue area that is a tool of both capacity building and security, encryption technology. Our team at R Street has adopted the motto, embrace reality and deal with it. What this motto means in the context of the encryption debate is the realization that companies, individuals, governments, and other equities are going to use encryption technology. We cannot stop it, and we should not try to. Instead, we as a global community should embrace encryption technology. Ultimately, this debate is about balancing equities. Law enforcement, individual legislatures in our home states, various regional bodies, technology companies, privacy advocates, and human rights activists all have different important perspectives but we would argue that they share a common goal, security. These cipher technologies contribute greatly to an overall secure environment. The alternative, an insecure environment, is bad for everyone. We've heard calls from multiple delegates from various backgrounds to dissuade built-in backdoors or golden keys in encryption technology. We strongly back this position. 
There also seems to be debate among various states about public safety officials' abilities to force manufacturers and service providers to unlock devices and decrypt communications, that is, to rewrite software. Respectfully, we would like to mention that various states represented here have passed laws that, if implemented fully, could theoretically be used to force manufacturers and providers to unlock and decrypt devices and communications. We would encourage a careful review of these policies in light of the discussions we've had here over the past few days. The privacy of a data subject must be respected and upheld. To be clear, widespread encryption does come at a cost, such as limiting law enforcement's ability to solve or even prevent crimes, what many have come to call the going dark problem. However, I would like to note that we've yet to see data on the full scope of this problem and argue that encryption also allows for society at large to defend against malicious cyber actors from stealing our communications, personal data, and intellectual property. There are bad actors in cyberspace. We exist in a global zero trust network where it has become nearly impossible to avoid interacting with a compromised network. This will be even more true after the widespread deployment of 5G networks globally. Forums like this one are an important opportunity to call for member states to create and fortify agreements like those related to the data sharing, uh, to data sharing that the delegate from Interpol mentioned, uh, the Clarifying Law Lawful Overseas Use of Data Act, or the Cloud Act, uh, which is in the United States, and of course, the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, GDPR, Articles 45 through 49, obviously in the EU. These serve as important policy measures to govern secure cross-border data sharing in a degraded communication security environment. States and stakeholders must work together to craft policies that allow for different equities to protect their sensitive data. This relates well to capacity building because encryption technology is relatively inexpensive, especially when compared to the cost of a data breach. Much encryption technology is open source and as such can be an approachable means by which to strengthen data security for data both in transit and at rest. It's also worth noting that there are many stakeholders, a lot of whom are in this room, who would likely lend their experts to others in order to build capacity on these and other ICT-related issues. They likely don't know who to get in touch with um, to, to find those who are in need of this assistance. We agree with the delegate from Research ICT Africa and others who brought up the need for a central clearinghouse. We would encourage that as a part of the paper that member states of this working group draft, uh, that you all consider clarifying the use of encryption technology in relation to cross-border data transfers. Thank you to the translators for assisting in translating the more technical language in this intervention, and uh, thank you to the chairman for the time. Thank you. And I uh, call on the delegate from R Street Institute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Over the past three days, you have demonstrated great guidance, patience, and a much appreciated sense of humor. Thank you. I also want to say thank you to all the delegates and representatives from both sides of the aisle who have attended these meetings over the past three days. I have also been grateful for the opportunity to hear the perspectives of both my fellow stakeholders and member states. Cybersecurity is a global issue that impacts us all, and yet the risks and challenges we face are nevertheless often shaped by our regional differences. Therefore, it is impossible to create a more cybersecure world without consulting with those from all areas of the world. This is why this conversation cannot end when we all leave this room. The work of this working group and of the past GGEs is only the beginning. To the member states in this room, I encourage you to prioritize cybersecurity as a policy area. Governments should not be guided by a fear of technology, but should still acknowledge that technological innovation comes with risks that need to be addressed. To the other stakeholders in the room, I thank you for sharing your knowledge, your concerns, your resources, and your perspectives. We are inspired by the work already being done and optimistic about many of the proposals we have heard. Our organization has put forth several ideas of our own over the past three days in regards to where states can focus when implementing norms, including protecting the integrity of the global ICT supply chain, avoiding government backdoors in ICT products, or preventing competition in the ICT marketplace. We have also urged states to work together to promote safe cross-border data transfers through the use of encryption and to seek alternatives to data localization practices. 
we have proposed the possible creation of a cyber investigative group along the lines of the IAEA or the NTSB. And we believe member states and other stakeholders must prioritize the domestic implementation of international agreed-to norms before turning to long-term international legal agreements. I'd like to leave this group with one additional parting thought aimed primarily across the aisle at member states regarding the global rollout of 5G. Although we don't know all the future applications of 5G, many vendors promise that 5G has the potential to revolutionize the ICT world. And with 5G will become more network, more applications, more vendors, more infrastructure, and more security risks. If, like my colleagues and I, you believe technology can promote human flourishing, then join us in hoping that 5G's mores will also include more communication, more access to information, and more opportunities for human ingenuity to take us places we've yet to dream. But more can have a dark side if stakeholders and states aren't responsible in implementing proper security practices. Without the implementation of norms within the context of international law and human rights, we run the risk of allowing troubling behavior incorrectly justified in the name of national security or sovereignty. That's why we urge all states to prioritize the implementation of the 2015 GGE norms and cybersecurity in general, that they will walk away from this meeting and turn the ideas you've, that you all have heard in the past three days into action. To conclude, it is important to appreciate that technological innovation moves quickly and often far more quickly than government institutions. As a result, states and stakeholders must continue to engage in dialogue with one another. Doing so grows institutional understanding of technology, which will help put in place policies that will more successfully promote, promote innovation, security, and economic growth. Again, we thank the chair for our time and for the opportunity to be part of this important conversation.